Hello again, photography students. This week we're going to be talking about exposure controls. And I know that that's a new term for a lot of you guys, but don't worry. We're going to be spending a good amount of time in the next few weeks um, discussing uh, photography concepts and a little tiny bit of light theory um, behind how your camera works and how to get it to take the photographs that you want. So let's get started. So what are the basic elements to consider in all photographs, okay? There are three of them, actually. The first one is the amount of light that's in the picture. So if we look at that group of uh, happy graduates there on the left, we'd say there's a lot of light, right? Or there's enough light that looks like it's properly exposed, which we're going to talk about in the next few slides. but. It looks like a bright sunny day out there and their main source of light is probably the sun. So that's considering the amount of light in that picture. The second element to think about is focus. So what appears to be in focus in this picture? A lot really, right? The foreground, the grass that they're standing on, that looks like it's in pretty good focus. It looks crisp and sharp. Their gowns definitely look in focus, their faces also. Now, if you see those trees in the background that are just peeking up over the hill that they're standing on, those don't look like they're in very good focus, right? They look out of focus or blurry. So there's a little bit in this photograph that's out of focus, but most of it is in focus. Okay, and the third element of this photograph that we can consider is motion. Right? Now, if they were just standing there smiling for the camera, there wouldn't be a whole lot of motion to consider. But in actuality, what are they doing? They're throwing their caps in the air, right? Because they just graduated. They're very happy about that. Um, the girl on the left looks like she's about to jump up to try to catch one of the hats, or maybe she just released it. So the motion in this picture has been frozen. And you can tell that some things maybe look a little blurry because they're actually in motion and the camera didn't freeze them completely. But there's definitely motion going on in this photograph. So those are the three basic elements that you consider in every photograph that you take, not just crime scene photographs. Okay, so the first thing we talked about was how much light was in that photograph on the left, the photograph of the graduating students throwing their hats in the air, right? So in photographic terms, we can describe the light in an image in three ways. This image we would consider to be properly exposed. And the reason for that is that everything looks the way that it looks to the human eye, okay? In a proper exposure, the photograph looks just like the eye sees it. It has the appropriate amount of light to reflect the scene the way a person would view it. So in this photograph, the sky is blue, the barn is red, the grass is green, and the lake in front is also a pretty deep blue. So. I would say that this photograph demonstrates a proper exposure. The person who took this photograph used the right amount of light so that it looks the way that they probably saw it on the day that they took it. Now how about this image? It's dark, right? It's actually quite underexposed. 
Okay, that's the term that photographers use when an image is described and the image appears too dark. Okay, the camera's exposure controls that we're going to talk about in a little bit were not set appropriately and not enough light reached the film or the camera sensor. So this image, as you can tell, is much darker than the first image and it's considered underexposed. And this situation is just the opposite, right? It's overexposed. If an image is overexposed, it can be referred to as blown out, right? There's too much light that was allowed into the camera, and the areas that had color or shadow, the way that our natural eye saw them, now appear too white, right? The sky is completely blown out. There's no blue color to it anymore. The um, roof looks hot as we would call it in photographic terms. It's, it's just got too much light going on in there. Okay, so that's an overexposure. So, obviously, in crime scene photography, you want your images to be properly exposed most of the time. So, how do we control the amount of light that enters the camera? And that is where exposure controls come in. Guys, if I can impart anything to you, <laughs> it's understanding that exposure controls are going to help you become a better photographer. Understanding exposure controls are the basis of all photography, whether it's crime scene or artistic, okay? So these exposure controls that we're going to talk about throughout the next three weeks or so are really, really important concepts to understand. So. These are, there are three different controls on your camera that can control how much light ends up in your photograph. Okay, there are apertures, which are also sometimes referred to as f-stops. There's the shutter speed that you select for your photograph. And there's the ISO setting. Now, obviously, the pictures that you take are going to be in different lighting conditions, right? If you take it outside on a bright sunny day, there's going to be sunlight out, maybe not a whole lot of clouds, and you took it at noon, there's going to be a lot of sunlight. Well, that's going to be quite different than if you take it in a dark parking, light, parking lot at midnight with only one lamppost uh, far off in the distance, right? So ambient light, the light that is in your scene, is also an important uh, factor to take into consideration. But that's not something you can control, right? I mean, you are where you are. <laughs> Your crime scene happens where it happens. So these three are the controls that you can actually manipulate to change the amount of light that's coming into your photograph. So for this week, we're going to talk about apertures, or f-stops. That's our first exposure control. So, what is an aperture? Well, an aperture is the variable size of the lens opening created by the diameter of the diaphragm. Well, <laughs> in English, this means the size of the hole in the lens, okay, and the camera that allows light to enter it. So, in this image, we're looking right into a camera lens, and you see that little hole that's made by those leaf shutters, okay? That hole is the aperture. That's all it is. The aperture is referred to by a number. So when we say apertures, we usually designate them by a number. Okay, and this number is known as an f-stop. Um, and it can be written both ways, both ways that you see here on the, uh, the slide. There's a mathematical equation that explains how each number is assigned to each whole size. But for this class, let's just look at the f-stop continuum and see what you notice, okay? Let's look at the one in the top uh, left corner there, f1.8. Now, the hole in that lens is relatively large, right? Definitely, I would call it large compared to, say, an f8 or an f11. See how small, how small the holes are um, and all of the apertures that are on the bottom of the screen, okay? So the large apertures are on the top, and they go from f1.8 2.8 to 4, 
5.6 is sometimes considered a medium size f-stop or aperture. And then the smaller ones are on the bottom, f8, f11, f16, and f22 is a really, really, really small aperture, a really, really, really small f-stop down there in the bottom right-hand corner. So apertures are, or f-stops, however you want to talk about them, the selection of those control the amount of light entering the camera. So if all other controls are left the same, the ones we haven't talked about yet, and the light in the scene stays the same, using a small aperture, like an f22, will let in less light than using a large aperture, like an f2. And here's another uh, little picture to show you the difference between big apertures and small apertures. Okay, or large apertures. This is another way that you can think about this concept. Okay, another way is to imagine the light in your photograph as water. Okay, and the picture, the um, the aperture control as uh, a faucet. Okay, if you open the faucet a little bit, only a small amount of water will drip out. Right, that's the image on the left, f22. A small little amount of water is coming through. If you open the faucet full blast, a lot of water is going to pour out. That would be the same as using an F2. So many first-time photography students have a tough time remembering that small numbers like 1.4 and 2 and 2.8, okay, those designate a large opening or large aperture. It sometimes seems kind of counterintuitive and students get them reversed a lot, which is understandable. Um, I suggest keeping an f-stop continuum chart nearby so that you can get used to looking at the actual openings near their f-stop numbers. So this one right here is perfect. Cut it out. You can put it on the front of your textbook. You can put it on your laptop. You can put it anywhere you like. Um, but just get used to looking at this image and remembering that the ones on the left, large apertures, okay, like f2.8 and f4, are bigger than the small apertures. F16, F22, things like that. Um, for right now, that little depth of field indicator down at the bottom, don't worry about that. <laughs> We're going to be talking about that um, in the next couple slides. Um, so that is something that I recommend uh, looking at and getting familiar with. But if that doesn't work, um, this is a funny <laughs> little slide that I added into my in-person class when I taught photography back in the day. And it's weird. And it's kind of bizarre, but it might help stick in your brain. And uh, that is the hope. So let's see if it works for you guys. OK, so an f22 uh, is a small aperture, right? We just saw that on the f-stop continuum. But one way to remember that is a 22 caliber round or bullet is really small, right? That's a small little bullet compared to, say, uh, a 45. So you can remember 22 is small because 22 caliber bullets are very small. <laughs> okay, in crime scene, that's a pretty common image. Um, F2, on the other hand, is big, right? So for this one, it made me think of Tupac. <laughs> now, if you guys aren't a huge West Coast rap fan, that's fine. Um, a lot of people still know who he is. And he was a big, larger-than-life rapper, right? Everybody knew his name. Um, so those are the two images that stick in my mind when I have to remember what a small aperture is and what a big aperture is. So take it for what you will. <laughs> um, hopefully it's a bizarre enough example that it uh, sticks in your brain. That's the hope. Okay, so we now know that changing the f-stop or changing the aperture in your camera changes the amount of light coming into it, right? We know that the f-stops on the left side of the continuum, like f1.4 and f2, are big apertures, okay? Big holes in the camera and the lens, so they let in more light. And the apertures on the right side of the continuum, like f22 and f16, are small holes, so they let in a small amount of light. But if you change from an f4 to an f5.6 or from an f8 to a 5.6, what actually happens to the amount of light? How much do we change it by? Okay, let's look at the continuum again. 
without worrying about the mathematical formula that explains why. That's in your textbook. And if uh, you're a math whiz and uh, this is going to help you understand it, I suggest uh, reading through those textbook pages. But all I really want you to understand um, from this example is that stepping one way or the other on the continuum changes the light by one stop. Okay? That's a photographer term. And we're going to talk about what that means. So. If you move one stop to a smaller aperture, let's say we started at an f8 and we move to an f11, that's one stop on the continuum, right? That's one stop, so you're cutting the light in half in your image, okay? So if you went to an f8 to an f11, you cut the light in half. If you went to an, from an f8 to an f16, you've cut the light in half by moving to f11 and then another half by moving to f16, so that's a quarter of the light. All right. Now let's say you go the other way. If you move one stop to a larger aperture, moving to the left, you've doubled the light in your image. So if you move from an f5.6 to an f4, you've doubled the light. If you move from an f5.6 uh, to an f4 and then to an, an f2.8, you've actually quadrupled the light, okay? It's four times as bright as it was in the original image. So this is kind of a tough concept to wrap your brain around. It's probably the most complex concept we're going to talk about in class this term. So let's look at an actual picture example of what I'm talking about. Here we go. So let's say you, the photographer, decide to take a picture. You want to take a picture of a cute little puppy dog and you decide to use a f5.6. Okay, so looking at this image, it's actually proper exposure. But let's say we decided, you know, there's not enough light in this image. I want to add more light to it. It's not bright enough for me. So you, as the photographer, change to an f4. Now we've moved to the left on the continuum, right? And so we've made a bigger hole in our lens, a bigger aperture what happens to the image, it's brighter. And how much brighter is it? Well, we changed from uh, an f5.6 to f4. That's one stop, plus one stop, right? So it doubled the light in the image. Now let's go back. Okay, you start again at a f5.6, and let's say this time you decide Mm, there's too much light in this original image. I want it to be a little bit darker. As a matter of fact, I want there to be half the amount of light in this image. So, you change one stop to the right. We've now changed from an f5.6 to an f8, which is one stop on the continuum, one stop less bright, and look what happens to the image. It's got half the amount of light in it. So changing to an f8 from an f5.6 cuts the light in the image in half by one stop. So that's the example I have for you guys. I hope it makes um, this concept a, a little more visual and a little easier for you to understand. Remember that these lecture videos are for you to use whenever you want. So if it doesn't make sense the first time around, uh, feel free to replay it. Um, until you feel like you have it a little bit more uh, solid in your brain. And don't worry, these are new concepts, so if it starts to seem a little confusing, that's okay, uh, because it's the first time you've been exposed to this kind of material. So give yourself some time, give yourself a break, and uh, just come back to it uh, if you feel like you need a refresher throughout the course at any time. Okay? Okay, so there's a flip side to this. While f-stop selection and the resulting aperture that we just talked about have an effect on the light that's coming into your camera, it turns out that there is another characteristic of your photographs that is also affected by this particular exposure control. 
So you remember the three basic elements of all photographs, right? The amount of light in the picture, the amount of the picture that appears to be in focus, and motion, right? So of these three, which do you think the aperture selection affects? Turns out that it's focus, okay? Aperture selection or f-stop selection has an effect on the focus in your image and photographers describe this as the depth of field. And here's another definition for you guys. The depth of field is the variable range from foreground to background of what appears to be in focus. So let's look at some examples. In this image, you can definitely see that the tulips in the foreground, right, the ones that are closest to you and also to the bottom of your picture there, those are in focus, right? You can tell that those are definitely tulips and you can even make out some of the little veins in the petals. Those are in focus, right? Now, as we work our way into the image, the center of the image and the background of the image, that's very fuzzy. It's out of focus. So, if you're looking at how much of this image is actually in focus, it's not much. It's just those tulips in the foreground, right? The foreground is pretty much the only thing that's in focus. So this image would be considered to have a narrow depth of field. It's not talking about uh, millimeters or feet or miles or anything like that. It's talking about the image as a whole object, okay? so. In this image, only a very small portion of it, the foreground, is in focus. So we would consider this to have a narrow depth of field. Okay, how about this one? Now we're kind of focusing in on a smaller uh, item, right? Just a little basket, not a whole big field like we saw in the last one. Just a little basket full of peppers and onions and things like that but everything appears to be in focus, right? The wicker basket in the bottom left hand corner, the potatoes, the peppers, the onions, even the boards all the way in the background, they're all basically in the same focus. You can even make out some of the grain in the wood panels back there, right? So because basically everything in this image is in focus, we would consider this to have a wide depth of field. How about this one? Everything's basically in the same focus, right? The rocks, the clouds, the ripples in the water, it's all in focus. So we call it a wide depth of field. For this one, we basically have the same situation, right? From foreground to the center of the image all the way to the background pretty much everything is still in focus. Maybe you start to lose a little bit um, back in the mountains there, but that's not necessarily an element of focus. That could just be the haze um, or the fog that's settling in back there. In this image, a majority of everything's in focus, so we call it a wide depth of field. How about this one? pretty obvious, right? There's only one tiny little part of that uh, flower stem in there that's in focus. So this has a narrow depth of field, which is also sometimes referred to, referred to as poor or shallow. But for this class, we'll talk about depth of field as either being wide or narrow, just so it's a little less confusing. How about this one? Everything's pretty much in focus. I can tell where the little planks are in the house in the background. I can see the petals in the foreground. There might be a few little wisps of uh, wheat or whatever that is um, that are slightly out of focus. Um, but that actually could be motion blur, which we're going to talk about um, at, in another lecture. But a majority of the items in this photograph are in focus, so we're going to call this wide depth of field.
this brings us to our next cardinal rule. There's our little cardinal friend. You always want to maximize depth of field. A key for a good crime scene photographer is to make sure the viewer of your photograph can see the scene as it was, right? It needs to be a fair and accurate representation of the scene. So we don't want elements of the image to be out of focus. Um, there would really be no point in that. Using um, a narrow or a shallow depth of field is really something that artistic photographers use all the time, but for us in crime scene photography, we really want to stick with maximizing the depth of field. We want everything to be in focus so the person looking at the image can see everything in as much detail as possible. So I know what you're thinking. You're saying, okay, Rachel, well, <laughs> you want me to maximize the depth of field, but how do I do that? Well, you need to choose the correct aperture. Okay, it turns out that small apertures like f22 will create a very wide or good or great depth of field in your photographs. Everything will be in focus. Okay, those words are kind of used interchangeably um, in photographic terms to refer to depth of field. So if you hear wide, good, great, those all mean that everything in the image is pretty much in focus. On the flip side of that, large apertures like f1.4 and 2.8, those have a shallow or a narrow or a poor depth of field. Okay, so you want to stay away from those as much as possible. Now, you'll find that this is not really a concern <laughs> for most automatic cameras. Um, if you can even see the apertures on an automatic camera, you'll see that the camera chooses them for you. You take a meter reading, which we'll talk about um, in the next week's lecture, and the camera will choose all of this for you. You don't have any control over your depth of field at all. That's why pretty much all crime scene photographers nowadays use DSLR cameras or digital single lens reflex cameras, and they have a manual function. And the cameras that are should be coming out of the um, bookstore now also have that option. So if not, uh, please email your instructor uh, so they can talk to you um, about what your camera is actually capable of. But this, the exposure controls that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, these are why you really need a camera with a manual or a program setting so that you can play around with these exposure controls to see how they actually affect your image. Okay. So a good rule of thumb is to take crime scene photographs at an f8. That's pretty much a medium size aperture or f-stop, but it's actually considered pretty small. Um, and it gives a relatively uh, good depth of field, okay? It gives you a wide depth of field. So here are your takeaway points for this lecture, okay? Exposure controls determine how much light enters your camera. And aperture selection affects the amount of light because aperture selection is one of those exposure controls, but it also affects depth of field. Small apertures like f22 will give you a wide or a good or a great depth of field. And large apertures like f1.4 and f2 are going to give you a shallow, narrow, or poor depth of field. Okay, so those are your takeaway points for your video lecture for week two. See you guys in the classroom.